come and join us as the other tents wind up. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome you to the Martha's Vineyard Book Festival. Um, as you know, the book festival is free, but we really appreciate uh, donations and support. Um, I don't know if there are any bags left. They look like they were kind of flying out of here, but you can get a bag with a donation. And of course, supporting the authors and purchasing the books in the book signing tent um, is another way to support them and us. Um, there's also food available from the home port behind the art shack. Um, I am pleased to inter introduce Dawn Brash, who is the owner of Bunch of Grapes Bookstore, um, the beloved Bunch of Grape Bookstore here on the island, um, and she will take us forward from there. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Um, when Sue Ellen came to ask me if I would be willing to introduce Sarah, I said, are you kidding? She's long been an, I'll embarrass her a little bit, an idol of mine in the cooking world. Um, she is the founder of Nantucket, uh, the Nantucket specialty shop and catering business called K Sarah Sarah in the 1980s. She's a co-author of the Silver Palette Good Times Cookbook author of Nantucket Open House Cooking and Cold Weather Cooking. She's the author of Pedaling Through Provence and Burgundy. And she's the author of Saltwater Seasonings. Uh, when I had my little catering business, her uh, Cold Weather Cooking and Nantucket Open House were the two cookbooks that we most often had the most requests from for repeat business. So uh, in June 2015, after about a 20 year hiatus, although she did a lot during that time, which she'll cover. Uh, she released her eagerly anticipated new cookbook called New England Open House. Uh, she works as a consultant for Ina Garten. She teaches cooking classes, and she and her husband, Nigel, are owners of Coastal Goods, a retailer of fine seasoning blends. Please help me welcome Sarah Leah Chase. Thank you, Doug. Um, I want to start, Sarah, uh, and she's going to stand because she's reading, um, and it's easier than uh, holding the mic. You began at Harvard uh, studying European intellectual history. How did you get from there to opening Kesara Sarah on Nantucket? Well, I want to uh, confess that uh, I did get the glance of the few questions that I was going to be asked uh, beforehand. And uh, I thought that uh, rather than just ramble on, some of the, many of the questions that Dawn was going to ask me were answered in introductions to my book. And in early June on Nantucket, I participated in the Nantucket Book Festival, and we were celebrating the 30th anniversary of uh, this, my first cookbook book on my own, the Nantucket Open House Cookbook, and it was just so hard for me to believe it was 30 years, but I went back and was flipping through it. I recreated a lot of the specialties in my shop, and we had a buffet luncheon, but I also read the introduction uh, to the book, which was an ode to falling in love with Nantucket and why I wanted to open a business there. But after talking about all the things I loved in Nantucket, I went on to say how I decided to go from um, Harvard to running a food business, and this is what I had written. Um, it took some maturing to sort out the real significance of all my impressions. In the meantime, I also took the usual collegiate plunge into exploring the philosophical purpose of life. A strange but satisfying balance ensued in spending part of my year searing swordfish steaks and simmering batches of ratatouille, and the rest dancing upon Nietzschean tightropes, dipping into existential abysses, and waiting for a Godot. An undeniable clue to my future occurred when I realized that my stack of gourmet magazines had superseded in thickness my senior honors thesis in language. At that point, I concluded I might fare better by shuttering the encumbering words of my abstract essays and instead confront my love for Nantucket with the seemingly more supple medium of cooking. Bertrand Russell beckoned no longer and instead Briat Savaron blazed the path to new ways of communication and from fulfillment. Tell me what you eat and I will tell you what you are. As I was understandably nervous about my leap from scholar to shopkeeper, I decided to name my food business K Sarah Sarah, reasoning that if one 
questionable course of life failed, the name was versatile enough to sustain a few more trial ventures. Perseverance pr prevailed and eventually gained me an adorable and affordable pink, pink is my favorite color, heaven, shuttered shop in a former rooming house in the heart of town. Once I got the life's investment of kitchen equipment, which was too wide to pass through the narrow Nantucket doorways off the street and into the shop, I hired the artist tenant on the floor above me to help with chopping, dicing, and dishing both salads and people. I also snagged a beautiful wandering student who read Women in Love during the store's initial slow moments to sell my first culinary creations. I had no real scheme in mind except to cook the foods I liked most, which were predominantly cold preparations utilizing Nantucket's ocean bounty in combination with inspirations from European travels. I hoped that if I approached this task with enough integrity and passion, other lovers of Nantucket would share an appetite for my own personal culinary whims. The transition to the professional field of cooking was not terribly difficult, as I soon discovered that my sabatier chopping knives were almost as dangerous as my collegiate nihilism, and that the very hands that once beheld being in nothingness so well adjusted amiably to onions and potatoes. <laughs> So, life changed for you at Kesra Sarah the day that Sheila Lukens of Silver Palette fame uh, came through the front door. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you went from asked to being a taster for the next Silver Palette? And you all remember the Silver Palette cookbooks. Um, how you went from being a taster to actually being co-author of one of the first cookbooks to land on the New York Times bestseller list. Um, well, Sheila didn't actually walk through the door. She called me on the phone and didn't identify herself. Um, she was coming out to Nantucket to do a tasting of the product line they had then. They were the first people to have raspberry vinegars and all these esoteric mustards and things. And uh, the uh, sweet and rough oatmeal is still around. The company was, was sold, but that's still on the uh, product that it's available on the shelves. But anyway, she said, uh, I'm coming to Nantucket tomorrow, and I need 12 dozen croissants, a baked ham, blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, I, I just have a small business. I could never do all of this on such short notice. And she said, well, this is Sheila Lukens for the Silver Palette Calling. And that was like God <laughs> calling me. And I said, oh, well, uh, maybe I will reconsider. And I stayed up all night. <laughs> I made the required goods, and Sheila and her husband Richard were spending the week vacationing on the island, and we just uh, really uh, hit it off, and she came into my shop frequently and felt that to my food uh, was the most similar in sensibilities uh, to the Silver Palette's food. And uh, that winter, I wanted to get off the island of Nantucket. I was, even though I traveled all over Europe, I was terrified of New York City and I wanted to get over my fear of New York City. And uh, I went down to New York and slipped a note under the door of the Silver Palette and said, you know, I'm looking for some winter work and uh, I don't want to make chicken salad 24 hours a day because that's what I do in the summertime on Nantucket. And at this point, they were just starting work on uh, the second Silver Palette Good Times cookbook. And they hired me to test recipes that they made available. That's what the contract said. Uh, it became very clear to me after a week that no recipes were being made available. <laughs> the availability was coming from my brain, but I was given carte blanche and a Greek taxi driver to take me all over New York City. I could buy anything I wanted and cook whatever I wanted. So this was a self-education uh, period for me. And Sheila and Julie would come to my apartment, which was appropriately in Hell's Kitchen, every Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> their Friday afternoon and you know taste what I had made and it was either a thumbs up or a thumbs down as far as the uh, the uh, recipes went I was always praying after they left they didn't see the stream of all my other friends coming in to eat all the, all the leftovers that they had just tasted but uh, those were the, the good old days well anyway when it t came time to edit the silver palette good times cookbook a lot of editors ask an awful lot of questions about recipes and uh, Suddenly, you know, nobody could answer the questions about the recipes, and I was dragged out of a back room, and um, I was the one that could answer the questions because I had done the majority of the recipes, and uh, that was what uh, eventually led to my getting the co-author status on the Silver Palette Good Times Cookbook. Um, 
Then in 1987 came your own cookbook, as you referred to, the Nantucket Open House, uh, published in 1987. It went on to have 20 printings, sold over 250,000 copies. In 1990 came Cold Weather Cooking, best beef stew recipe ever. You don't have to braise the meat. <laughs> <laughs> Brown it. <laughs> five, year, five years, five yeah. years. Oh, forgive me. Five hours in the oven. Don't touch it. It's my kind of cooking. <laughs> uh, it is the one of the best, if not the best. <laughs> Thank beef you. Stew recipes. So then, 15 years until New England Open House, um, which really is a love story to New England in my mind. It's a culinary journey through all parts of New England, with a concentration on, or an appreciation for local bounty, particularly. Cape Cod, maybe, because that's where you're living currently. But can you talk about uh, what you did in those, why did it take so long? Um, well, um, interestingly enough, the uh, introduction to my New England Open House cookbook is entitled, How Long Does It Take to Write a Cookbook? <laughs> um, and I explain it in depth there. But the major stumbling blocks to, to my being so prolific as I was in the uh, late 80s and 90s writing cookbooks was in 1995 I got married in 1997 I became a mother and in uh, 1999 um, my, my little family moved off of Nantucket to Cape Cod and uh, I call it the three M's uh, marriage, motherhood uh, and moving put a severe dent in my pr productivity <laughs> Um, do you want to read, or are you going to? Um, well, uh, if you, um, the question was originally, I didn't want to do the New England yeah. cookbook, and I will. But, uh, but the New England cookbook wasn't your idea. Workmen came to you. Yes, they, they came to it, yeah. and I be I begin the introduction by saying, originally it was not my idea to write a cookbook about New England food, and it was most certainly not my intention to take over five years to complete it. When Peter Workman, the ingenious founder and eponymous and wonderfully of the eponymous and wonderfully invented inventive publishing imprint first suggested the topic to me, I resisted and insisted rather vehemently that I was not a New England cook. Although I have lived in New England my entire life and cannot imagine calling any other place home, my attitude towards what constituted authentic New England cooking was by the time at that time tainted by an acceptance of the bleakness expressed by Henry Cabot Lodge rather than elevated by the sort of optimism exuded by Jasper White. And I had opened the introduction with Henry Cabot Lodge saying what a cruel and awful place <laughs> New England was and Jasper White extolling all the wonderful food that you could find in New England. I had spent a fair amount of time combing through older New England cookbooks at Sturgis, my local and beloved Cape Cod library, after I had been asked to give an informative speech about the history of clam bakes to a corporate group from the Midwest attending a conference replete with a pit dug clam and lobster extravaganza at the Char Chatham Bars Inn on the Outer Cape. I found the research quite tedious and uninspiring and became all the more convinced that my culinary sensibilities fared best when ignited by the open air markets of Paris, Provence, and Tuscany, rather than constrained by a legacy of puritanical plainness and Yankee practicality. <laughs> And uh, this introduction that I'm reading here is the one that's unedited. These following lines were edited out of the introduction, so it always gives me great pleasure <laughs> to throw them in. Uh, I said, after all, I preferred pungent anchovies to bland salt cod, Tuscan fagioli al olio to Boston baked beans, and crusty Parisian baguettes to Parker House rolls. However, my resistance to Peter Workman's New England vision gradually began to wane when my very wise agent, Doe Coover, gave me a pep talk about all the New England experiences I already had going for me. She cited my growing up in Connecticut, summering in Maine, attending colleges in Vermont and Cambridge, living and running a business on Nantucket for several years, and now making my home on Cape Cod. Certainly, Doe reasoned, or perhaps pleaded, I could easily fill in the missing New Hampshire and Rhode Island components. 
I listened and eventually came to the conclusion that I could indeed write a cookbook about the way I cooked every day, year round, with prized New England ingredients in my New England kitchen, and that I would set out to do so in a way that didn't make me quasi comatose like so many other New England cookbooks had done when I did my clam bake research. Bushels of briny oysters, legions of lively lobsters, pails of wild beach plums, rashers of applewood smoked bacon, and wedges of cloth bound cheddar cheese later. I owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to both Peter and Doe for allowing me to discover there truly is no place like home. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, you always have billed yourself as a home cook, mm -hmm. but there w there's a big difference between Nantucket Open House Cookbook, Cold Weather Cooking, Silver Palette Cookbook. There's a big difference from that those cookbooks to New England Open House. It isn't that you don't have involved recipes in New England Open House, but your earlier cookbooks were very involved. I mean, lists of ingredients. Was it a different time in cooking then? That was kind of the explosion of cooking and us being interested. Well, there was a culinary revolution taking place and all these European ingredients were suddenly becoming uh, fashionable. And to be on the cutting edge in the culinary world, you wanted to do what everybody else was doing and be using sun-dried tomatoes and the most obscure extra virgin olive oils and you know whatever happened to be trendy uh, at the moment. But then this big shift occurred where um, the hottest thing was to use local ingredients, which was something I had to do from the beginning uh, on Nantucket. And uh, whenever you're writing about um, a regional place, it really is pride in the local ingredients. Um, so that's perhaps one reason why some of these recipes appear to be simpler. And then I also think that 3M thing with the marriage, the motherhood, and the moving, <laughs> cutting into everything I used to do. Um, I mean, it was nothing for me to spend a week planning a dinner party before I got <laughs> before I got married. Uh, it's, it's different uh, when uh, you're married and you've got a kid that plays in several different sports teams and uh, you're uh, you have to get something on the table quick and I would you know refuse to use convenience foods and so I had to uh, I had to simplify my cooking but it's also reflective of I think the overall um, Yankee attitude towards food so um, you revolutionized my life when you talked about cloth bound cheddar um, I didn't know about it until she did the event at Bunch of Grapes um, two years ago and she talked about it and it forever changed my cheddar cheese biscuits. Um, do you have any other <laughs> tips, food loves you have, um, techniques or anything that you would like to share with us? Um, well, um, yeah, the discovering what you can do with local ingredients is always wonderful. In uh, my uh, panel discussion yesterday in Edgartown, um, I talked about uh, a recipe uh, for a um, warm goat cheese salad I have with a beach plum um, glaze. And uh, the idea for the warm goat cheese salad came from uh, the Chez Panisse uh, restaurant, but I wanted to give it a, uh, a New England twist. And uh, and also because I do a lot of uh, private dinner parties where wine is involved, it's very hard to uh, find a salad that can carry a, a wine. And adding the beach plums add the fruitiness that can go with you know finishing off a good bottle of a French red wine and serving a salad as after the main course. Um, and uh, so this was you know something I discovered just playing around with local ingredients, taking uh, you know a fashionable recipe and then uh, adding the New England component of um, the the beach plum jam. Uh, to the salad and it uh, it's not terribly difficult to make and I highly recommend when September rolls around and you're all out beach plumbing that you try the salad. <laughs> um, okay maybe we'll open it up I mean I could talk forever <laughs> about why the heck in your shortbread hearts cookies I have to sieve hard-boiled eggs. Oh uh, well, that's a Pol that recipe? yeah. It was a Polish cookie recipe. Well, and my they do that in Poland. And I <laughs> argued back and forth every year at Christmas. We made from her cookbook um, their heart-shaped shortbreads yeah. 
but you there are two layers and you know you've got the raspberry jam in the middle that you cut out the heart in the middle so the jam shines through I'm well, not a good descriptive person but um, and one of the pieces of this recipe and we would make this times you know 300 so you hated me, so I hated <laughs> me. But I insisted because I was a cook who cooked by the recipe that you had to hard boil the eggs and sift them. Um, my catering partners did the cookies without doing that, but I could taste the difference. Good. Well, it's like you know oh, some no. Well, some recipes you have to sift flour, right. and it makes for a lighter batter. If you don't sift the eggs, you you get clumps of it in there, and it makes for you know very fine grating well, that gets into hard boiled. Like, what does the hard boiled egg do in a cookie? I think I think yours is the only recipe I've ever had. Uh, there are there are other it, it really really enriches it yeah in a different way and it is that that type of cookie is um, I'm half Polish it's a very you know popular technique used in Polish cookery uh, in baked goods <laughs> <laughs> but yes I'll leave it to you guys <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm from the South. I'm from, I was born in Mississippi and I live in Atlanta now and I'm visiting for the mm -hmm. weekend. And a part of our cooking is spices, is a um, source of spices, uh, both regional New Orleans versus Atlanta versus Char Charleston mm -hmm. versus South Florida, I mean North Florida. So what, tell me what the major spice of the Northeastern, the New England palate is and what can you expect Per region. Okay. Well, it's very uh, different than the uh, than the, the South. I know. Uh, you know. I'm sometimes uh, just astounded by the list of uh, spices that will be called for in a, a New Orleans recipe uh, and some of the other ingredients. But I always say, you know, the proof is in the final taste, and uh, <laughs> that food in, in uh, New Orleans is very is is very good. Um, it's much more basic in New England. There isn't a spice I could could say. It's more or like you know pickling spices dill seed celery seed a lot of lemon juice just to enliven the flavor of uh, seafood uh, butter I, I go on and on in, in the in the book about a hand churned butter from Maine called Kate's butter it's salted and it makes everything you know that seafood tastes more the way it, it should be it's just a, it's just a magical thing but it's nothing complex like you have um, down in down in the south and I in my own cooking uh, use an awful lot of, uh, of fresh herbs um, as opposed to dried thank you I don't know what the lady went yeah sure as I pull older bookshelves off, or uh, cookbooks off of my bookshelf, some have aged a lot better than others. Some, you look at a recipe from a cookbook in the 80s, the 70s, or the 60s, and you can tell this is a really old recipe. Is that the result of changing tastes, changing techniques, and as you write a new cookbook, do you think about its lo the, a recipe's long-term relevance and whether this is something 10 or 15 years down the road, this is still something people are going to want to go. Um, I don't think down the down the road uh, in that sense. But interestingly enough, when I had to choose the recipes uh, to feature at this 30th anniversary uh, gathering on Nantucket, and they were all going to be from this cookbook, it was, uh, you know, people tell me all the time they still cook from it, but I had a hard time selecting the recipes, and it was the first time in my life that many of them um, struck me as, as a little bit dated. And the criteria I used was I wanted to uh, reflect uh, recipes that would stood the test of time, but also were somewhat cutting edge for me to be doing 30 years ago. Uh, for example, I did um, stuffed grape leaves, uh, which I, you know, I still love, but nobody was stuffing their own grape leaves 30 years ago, and I don't think too many people, except you know, the Greeks I know, <laughs> are, are doing it now. Uh, again, going back to my Polish roots, um, I have a kielbasa vinaigrette. Uh, salad in here and that was a huge hit at the gathering um, and people had you know forgotten about it and I insisted although I could get great uh, 
Polish kielbasa up in Boston or Chicopee or Chicago or whatever. On Nantucket, I always used to make it with the Hillshire Farms kielbasa that I could get at the stop and, stop and shop, and I insisted on doing it that way. And people said, wow, you know, I, I can't believe this. And then the, the chicken and grape salad is just one of those, those timeless salads. But, you know, other things like there's a scallop with, you know, a chervil vinaigrette, which to me is a little bit too fussy. It's hard to grow chervil, and a lot, not a lot of people do that, and that was more reflective of trying to, you know, capture esoteric ingredients um, at the at the time. But also, um, there wasn't, uh, when I wrote this this book, this idea that you had to get the, uh, use five ingredients or less, or get the meal on the table in under uh, half an hour, it was just exploring the passion for good food and, 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 and good taste. And, uh, you know, I think that that's a, a rule of thumb that uh, will continue to hold through, at least I hope through the rest of my lifetime that people want, uh, you know, real ingredients, uh, real food, and food that tastes good. And just to follow up on that, would you, um, wasn't the New England Open House in part recipes that had been passed down? For I mean, didn't you include some, like, I, for instance, her mother's cucumbers, they're really good. Yeah. You know, there were things like that that have stood the test of time that have been passed down that are included in this. Yes, I've probably made, you know, 30 different types of cucumber salads, and I just love my mother's, and she does it in a different way than anybody else. She, you know, salts the cucumbers and the onions uh, together. It's a quicker recipe, and when I've taught it in cooking classes, people just come up and they just say, oh, I've been looking for the way my mother used to make the cucumber salad uh, for, for years, and you've, you know, this, this is it. Um, I didn't want to do... Um, the traditional baked beans. I uh, attended a couple of bean hole bean parties up in Maine, and I remember somebody saying that New Englanders like to make uh, a lot of work of having a good time. Uh, you know, who wants to spend 24 hours <laughs> taking a pit and another 24 waiting for the beans to cook? And my brother, who's a chef up in Maine, was you know very helpful in uh, contributing some of the recipes to the New England book. And he's just uh, he's got uh, a wonderful just stovetop bean pot recipe in there that uh, I adore. He uses the traditional salt pork, but he puts a knob of uh, fresh ginger in there uh, that really permeates the beans and makes it taste, make them, makes them taste wonderful. I have a question. I found my grandmother's um, recipe book about four or five months ago. And I was looking at some of the how you cook it, in what temperature, and one was moderate heat, mm -hmm. one was high heat, one was low heat, one was moderate high. How do you discern what is that? Well, you know, people knew a lot more instinctually about cooking in the olden days. Uh, you know, I say it drives me crazy, the questions my editor asks, because they want everything explained, assuming that anybody reading your cookbook, you know, knows knows nothing. A lot of measurements in the old days were, you know, an, an egg size piece of butter or uh, a shot glass of this or whatever. But I would definitely say, you know, moderate heat would be 350, high heat would be 425, uh, low heat would be between 250 and 275. What's your favorite recipe? Well, uh, that's a question it's I get. Like your favorite <laughs> cookbook. No, uh, it's a question I get asked a lot, and uh, I say that I wouldn't to have written a book with 300 recipes if I had one that was a favorite. I just published one. And mind you, I don't think I'll ever write another book with 300 recipes in it, and that's another reason why it took so long to do, but it was a requirement of the publisher. Um, but uh, in this book, I became known across uh, the nation for my scallop puff recipe that caterers everywhere you know, made and thanked me, and it was one of the few recipes I repeated in the um, New England Open House Cookbook because for and Nantucket, you know, convinced me that there was a whole generation that didn't know what a scallop puff was and they needed to know. But um, I've made so many scallop puffs, uh, I can't even bear to eat them any longer. But I think the uh, heir to the scallop puff is a recipe in the New England Open House Cookbook that I call Fig and Pig. And it was inspired by an appetizer I had at Primo Restaurant in Rockland, Maine, which is uh, 
probably my f favorite restaurant in New England, if not the country. Uh, it's uh, Melissa Kelly, female chef, and uh, it's the true farm to table restaurant. And it's a, uh, my adaptation is a, uh, a crostini bruschetta that's topped with uh, blue cheese, um, a whole fig and then you, it's um, little toasted slivers of almond and pancetta, pancetta that you poke into the blue cheese like a porcupine uh, and then you heat it up and you just get this wonderful mix of the sweetness of the fig, the pungency of the blue cheese, the saltiness of the pancetta and the crunch of the almonds all in a mouthful and I just adore it and I don't think I'll ever get tired of that like I did the scallop puffs. You're making me hungry. Any other questions? One, one more question. Yeah. All right, thank you. Both You're welcome. Thank you, Don.